was the starting point of a new American business venture abroad. But ahead, there was a long, long distance to travel, a huge investment, years of effort, and no end of patience and perseverance. Most important of all, the job would require men, hardy men, determined men, Men who were willing to leave families and friends and journey halfway around the world on a quest that might end in failure. Men who could face hardship and monotony and still take it. The United States has been involved in this empire building process since approximately the end of World War II. But most of it has been done secretly. It's been done by economic hitmen like me. CIA agents don't call themselves spooks or spies, and they don't usually even call themselves CIA agents. They're the commercial attache or the political attache at a U.S. embassy or something, they put some other official title. It's not usually spy or even CIA agent. And it, it was the same with us. It's a, economic hitman is a generic term, and, uh, but it's not one that we, <laughs> you don't put on your business cards. It was very frightening to me. I knew that I was going up against strong forces. I saw jackals at work. There was always that question there, would this happen to me? I don't know how much longer I've got to live. Could be 20 more days, or it could be 20 more years. I needed to tell the story. Que interessante que tanta gente quieren charlar un poquito con un, con un gangster económico. Bueno, empezamos. Disculpe mi español y también disculpe mi vida. I was still in college at the National Security Agency, the, the United States' largest and probably most secretive spy organization, uh, recruited me. And they put me through a series of tests, personality tests, lie detector tests, and they identified me as a good potential economic hitman. And they also discovered a number of weaknesses in my character. And I think we could call those perhaps the, the three big weaknesses of our culture money, power, and sex. Uh, and when the NSA offers you a job at that level, they, they don't tell you what they're going to have you do. They say you're going to spend um, uh, about a year going through training, and at the end of that, you and they together will decide on your, on your assignment. I was at the Boston Public Library, which was right near the Charles T. Main offices where I worked, and I was doing research on some of the countries where I was working, and I was there looking for some information. I was having a difficult time finding some. contacted by this amazing woman named Claudine and uh, she knew all about my background she knew about my weaknesses 
she came up and, and uh, put a book in front of me on the desk, open to uh, some of the information I was looking for. And her card was there, and it said consultant to Charles T. Main, which was my company. And she proceeded to teach me about what it was to be an economic hitman, and at the same time to kind of seduce me into accepting the role. water supply permitted, wheat was grown, and the Arab, essentially good-humored in spite of his hard life, would make a little dance and a little song as he threshed the grain. And for townspeople and Bedouin alike, life was an endless struggle. None of them knew that this desert, barren of natural resources to the outward eye, had been blessed by nature beyond the wildest dreams of those who raided and struggled for life across its sandy, windswept wastes. We economic hitmen worked in many different ways, but probably the most typical way was that we would identify a country, like a third world country, that had resources that our corporations want, such as oil. And then we would arrange a huge loan to that country from an organization like the World Bank, but most of the money would go directly to some U.S. construction company or, or other contractor, uh, such as a Bechtel or a Halliburton. And those companies then would build huge infrastructure projects in this third world country, like power plants, industrial parks, ports. When Charles T. Main had a contract with the government, my job was to inflate the need as high as I could, make the loan as big as I could, uh, and this was, in essence, a policy. Among the more important undertakings for the benefit of the Saudi Arabs, wholly unconnected with oil operations, is the full-scale agricultural experiment project that is underway at al Khaj. This irrigation canal, in which the oil company helped the Saudi Arab government to build, is bringing water to an area of nearly 3,000 acres now under intensive cultivation. But the whole country would be stuck holding a huge debt, a debt so large that it couldn't possibly repay it. So at some point, we economic hitmen would go back to that country and say, look, you can't repay your loan, so do us a favor. Vote with us on the next critical United Nations vote or send troops in support of ours to someplace in the world like Iraq or, most importantly, sell your oil to us real cheap, or your labor pool, or some other resource that we want. So it was a, it's, a, it's an amazingly clever scheme, because the lines for tracing it were, 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 were very hazy. These private companies are paid by the government, but they're paid under these misleading contracts. So for instance, Charles T. Main, is hired to do economic hitman work, but it's considered engineering feasibility studies or economic feasibility study. And there was no direct connection. And of course, the other interesting thing is the money, we didn't even have to get the money that we loaned the countries. We got it through the World Bank. We'd set up an organization that was there to provide the money to do this. So we didn't need to provide it. Our, go our own government, the United States government, didn't have to provide it, except we provide some to the World Bank, so we didn't even have to put up the money. And in that way, we've managed uh, in the last 30 or 40 years to build the world's first truly global empire, and we've done it primarily without the military, primarily through economic hitmen. Claudine was very frank with me. She said, you know, this is a dirty business. If I were a banker and I were to offer a loan to someone, knowing full well that the person couldn't possibly repay the loan, but I made this offer because I wanted to get something from the person later on, that would be a crime in the United States. That's illegal. And she made that very, very clear to me. So she portrayed the, the, the dirty side of the business while at the same time holding out this offer of money and power and sex. And she told me what I'd be expected to do, and there it was.
And she let me know that I shouldn't consider going into that work, even taking my first assignment, unless I was convinced that I was going to stick with it, because, as she put it, once you're in, you're in for life. I was so sure I'd learned the right pronunciation. But when I tried my phrase book Spanish at Maracaibo Airport, nobody could understand a word. It brought home what I was told in the briefing sessions by Creole. I'm starting work in a foreign country for an American oil company. And I'll have to learn its ways, just as Creole has. We each represent the United States here, in the eyes of the Venezuelans. If you work directly for the CIA or the National Security Agency or one of the other government organizations, as the original economic hitmen did, and if you were discovered doing what we do, um, the government would be culpable. And fingers would be pointed and said, this is U.S. policy. It's much easier to go out and hire someone who's been trained by our military or perhaps by our CIA, has all the qualifications, knows exactly what he is doing, but does not work directly for the government, works for a private company. So if that person is caught, it cannot be traced back to the government. My next letter will be from Lagunillas, because I leave for the oil fields tomorrow. Love to you and the boys. Jim. Where is Daddy, Mommy? Well, Jeff, I'll just show you. We're here in the United States. And Daddy is down here in Venezuela. I had the driver take me for a ride around Caracas. He showed me the new sections in the east, where just 10 years ago there were sugar cane and coffee plantations. Some of the residential areas are almost futuristic. But others are so quiet and tranquil that you seem to be in another world. University City is one of the impressive sites of Caracas, another example of the prosperity oil has helped to bring to Venezuela. Every country in the world that has major supplies of oil has suffered. Oil is, is, is not a benefit for these countries. It's a benefit for a few of the very wealthy people at the top of the economic totem pole in these countries. You know, the whole theory of development lending is you borrow money from the World Bank, and by then you'll invest in this wonderful dam or adopt these wonderful policies which will promote economic growth, uh, which will easily pay back the loan and then more, so it's a good investment. But of course, this development lending doesn't work out. Uh, huge parts of the world have been going backwards. I mean, that's, you can look at uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, much of Latin, most of Latin America. It's been two lost decades. Uh, 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 you know, people, uh, in many ways, the 50 or 60 percent of the population of most Latin American countries are as poor as they've ever been, in some cases poorer. The Caracanos are especially proud of their low-rent housing projects. Huge apartment buildings, in clusters on the hillsides. We have nothing like them at home. In every one of these cities, you're probably going to find skyscrapers. And you're going to find a lot more people driving Mercedes Benzes. But if you go into the, the poor sections, you're going to find it overwhelmingly worse in much more numbers.
What they don't teach you in school, what you don't think about in general, is that when you help a country's economy, you don't necessarily help its people. You sometimes only help a very few of the very rich at the top, and that's true throughout what we call the third world. Identificamos un país que tiene recursos que nu nuestras corporaciones desean. Por ejemplo, en los 70s identificamos a Ecuador como un país lleno de petróleo. Yo le pregunto al arrepentido si a un gángster, a un sicario de la CIA, tiene conciencia y por lo tanto tiene credibilidad como para convencer de su arrepentimiento. He was a man who wanted Ecuador to go its own way. He wanted the indigenous people to not uh, have these U.S. oil companies come in and pollute the area and so forth. He was a very enlightened guy, not particularly radical. He was a good man. I mean, we liked him. We thought he was um, one of the better presidents in uh, Latin America. In the época, se duplicó el salario de los trabajadores y hasta la época no se ha vuelto a recuperar la capacidad adquisitiva que tenían los trabajadores en el año 80. Mi papá siempre, cuando le preguntaban cómo quería ser recordado, si como un gran presidente, si como un hombre brillante, y él era un hombre brillante, extremadamente inteligente, él una vez respondió, como un hombre bueno. Jaime Roldos was in favor of a hydrocarbons act that protects the oil of Ecuador and, and makes sure that the Ecuadorian people get a fair share of the profits of the oil that's taken up. Una de nuestras principales riquezas es el petróleo. El petróleo constituye hoy el filón principal de la riqueza ecuatoriana. As soon as one of these presidents is elected, he's immediately visited by an economic hitman. Someone who looks a lot like me walks into their office and he says, look, Mr. President, I'm here to congratulate you on being president. And he says, in this pocket, I've got a couple of hundred million dollars for you and your family if you play the game our way. And in this pocket, I've got a gun to shoot you with if you decide to fulfill your campaign promises. The decision is yours, but I want to remind you, remember Salvador Allende, remember Arbenz, remember Patrice Lumumba, remember, 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 there's a whole list of them. And these presidents all know, they know what happened to those people. Anyone that went up against the corporatocracy either died or got taken out of office. So what would you do in a situation like that? You know, I think we all have to ask ourselves, what would I do if I was in that situation? It's very, very difficult. Definitivamente, si uno ve eh, los últimos meses de su mandato, 
Básicamente, desde enero, fundamentalmente, encuentra muchos hitos de presión. Constantemente parece que recibía amenazas, recibía papeles que simplemente leía, rompía y tiraba, ¿no? Y eran muchas, aparentemente eran muchas amenazas contra ellos. Mi mamá estaba preocupada. defendiendo como hemos defendido la no intervención y la libre determinación de los pueblos y saludamos con beneplácito los avances democráticos que hacen los pueblos del mundo procuramos una América Latina más unida más fuerte y más solidaria When the economic hitmen fail, The next step is what we call the jackals. Jackals are CIA-sanctioned people that come in and, and try to foment a coup, a revolution. If that doesn't work, then they perform assassinations, so try to. Probemos el amor a la patria cumpliendo cada quien con nuestro deber. Nuestra gran pasión es y debe ser el Ecuador, nuestra gran pasión, oíteme, es y debe ser el Ecuador. ¡Viva la patria! After the plane crashed, the whole area was sealed off and not even Ecuadorian police were allowed into it. The only people allowed into it were U.S. military personnel and some very uh, higher echel echelon Ecuadorian military personnel. Local police officers were not allowed in. A couple of very, very key people who were going to testify during the hearings later that it was an assassination died in car crashes in Ecuador. These are Ecuadorians. Hubo mucha prisa por parte del gobierno que asumió el mando de cerrar el caso. Se hizo un informe en menos de una semana. Una semana. Y en una semana tenían listo el informe y dijeron que era un accidente. Realmente fue una pantomima. Realmente fue una pantomima. Arrebatarnos a, a sus hijos, arrebatarnos a su familia, arrebatarle a todo el país la, la posibilidad de, de enfrentar la verdad, de qué, qué es lo que realmente había sucedido. Y creo que eso es una de las peores cosas que le pueden hacer a uno, arrebatarle, ¿no? porque no hay cierre posible, porque siempre está presente, de alguna manera. Para mí siempre hay una duda, o sea, yo siempre quisiera saber más, quisiera saber qué pasó.
Milhouse's language, his rhetoric, was suspiciously like that of, of Chavez or Allende, or very much like Jaime Roldos, by demanding that there be a canal treaty, that the treaty reverts, to, uh, that the canal reverts to Panama, and uh, that Panama, Panamanian sovereignty be respected. He basically said no to the United States. He said, we're not going to do things your way anymore. This canal belongs to the Panamanian people. It, it bisects our country. We want it back, and we should have it back. This brought tremendous pride to Panamanians to have him say this. It changed their attitude tremendously. It, it, it increased their spirit. Americans here and the canal zone have always been emotional issues in Panama and Torrijos has demanded but not yet tried to enforce Panamanian sovereignty over the zone. In his speech Torrijos said, I know that many of you would like to go to the zone today but nobody's going. Let's wait and see how negotiation works. We have a full report if our talks with the United States fail, the Panamanian strongman added. If we have to die, we will die because we want a freer country. Uh, since the Panama Canal was a very strategic waterway, um, the dilemma of the United States is, uh, will you allow this man to be uh, um, you know, in control of a strategic waterway? Torrijos is a friend and ally of Castro and, like him, is pro-communist. He threatens sabotage and guerrilla attacks on our installations if we don't yield to his demands. Well, the Canal Zone is not a colonial possession. It is not a long-term lease. It is sovereign United States territory, every bit the same as Alaska and all the states that were carved from the Louisiana Purchase. We should end those negotiations and tell the general, we bought it, we paid for it, we built it, and we intend to keep it. I, Jimmy Carter, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. Congratulations. I was sent in to Panama to bring Omar Torrijos around, to bring him into our system, and he uh, refused to do that. He said, look, I know if I play your game, he told me directly, if I play your game, um, I'll become very rich. But that's not what interests me. I want to help my poor people. Ladies and gentlemen, the head of government of Panama, Mr. Torrijos Herrera, and the President of the United States, Mr. Jimmy Carter, today conclude a process where nobody negotiated in fear and where no one was afraid to negotiate. We are here to participate in the signing of treaties which will assure a peaceful and prosperous and secure future for an international waterway of great importance to us all. But the treaties do more than that. They mark the commitment of the United States to the, to the belief that fairness and not force should lie at the heart of our dealings with the nations of the world. The people of the United States, technologically advanced, opened up Panama and managed to communicate and link together two oceans 
in what is now a trip of only eight hours. Nonetheless, what happened to be a technological advance for mankind became a colonial conquest of our country as a result of historic deformations. What made Panamanians hopeful and what strengthened Panamanians' patience was the firm conviction that the American people are not a colonialist people. It was a, 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 a terrible uh, burden for me that I, I knew that if I didn't, I didn't really want to corrupt Terry Host because I'd admired his, his courage and his honesty and his, and his determination to help his poor people. I admired that. On the other hand, it was my job to corrupt him. And I felt that if I didn't corrupt him, then the jackals would come in and something much worse would happen to him. My presence here, together with the leaders and statesmen of this hemisphere, represents the conclusion of many struggles on the part of many generations of Panamanian patriots. solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. Todo el clima político cambió en América Latina. Carter era un hombre cercano, era un hombre eh, que había fomentado el clima de democracia, eh, Ronald Reagan no. You, the men and women of the CIA, are the eyes and ears of the free world. You are the tripwire across which the forces of repression and tyranny must stumble in their quest for global domination. Yo creo que él estaba preocupado, yo creo que la muerte de, de mi padre lo preocupó mucho, fue una especie de aviso. Y de hecho, un poco su familia dice que justamente Torrijos en cambio les dijo, ¿saben qué? O sea, si ya me matan, mejor déjenlo ahí, no, no arriesguen más, no se vayan a arriesgar. Good afternoon. This is a special news bulletin. Panamanian leader General Omar Torrijos Herrera has died. The 52-year-old strongman was killed when his Panama Air Force plane plowed into a mountainside during a pounding rainstorm in western Panama. His pilot and five other unidentified passengers were in the aircraft with him. There were no, no survivors. When I learned that Torrijos was killed, I was devastated. That was it. I was very, very sad. Personally, I, I admired the man. He was fun, charismatic. I really liked him. And I was also terribly saddened uh, for this, what it represented, for the symbolism that, that it, it, it deeply struck me that this is what my country does. General Torrijos is the second Latin American president to die in a plane crash in the last three months. Ecuadorian President Jaime Lobos... Aguilera now, of course, died last some day. maintain that these weren't just air crashes. These were political events that were staged. We have no proof. I mean, I don't know this for a moment, but um, uh, it's not beyond belief that these were not natural acts. There have been lots of political plane, cra plane crashes in Latin America. In fact, if you're a, pol if you're a Latin American politician, take the train. From the beginning of my tenure as an economic hitman, um, it bothered my conscience. And I was very torn. Up to that point, I'd lived a good life. I'd traveled first class all the time. But I'd reached a point where I could no longer justify this. I knew what we were doing was absolutely wrong. It was not to the best interests of humanity. It was not to the best interests of the future of the United States. It was totally contrary to those things. And I'd really begun to accept that.
as I got deeper in, into that process, I, I, was, I was bribed and, and really threatened. Uh, if I talked to people, if I let the word get out that I was in the process of exposing what we had done, it became very clear to me that I would pay serious consequences. And at the same time, at one point, I was offered about a half a million dollars uh, not to write the book. So I, I succumbed to this combination of bribes and threats. Being back in Ecuador for me is a, a mixture of feelings. Uh, and I feel very close to this country in many respects. I know I have to take a lot of responsibility because I was an economic hitman in the 70s. And I did a lot of things which caused problems here. And I feel terrible about that. Hubo gente que hizo sus carreras políticas sobre los cadáveres de mi padre. Se barrían los cadáveres debajo de la alfombra por la gobernabilidad. Y hemos llegado a un país que es ingobernable en los últimos años. The fact that we took Roldos out served an incredible notice on any future presidents of Ecuador. You know, so when the economic hitmen go in and say, you know, here's a couple of hundred million dollars for you and your family, or if you don't take that, here's a bullet. The temptation is to say, well, look, you know, I'll go along with it because maybe I can do something good, and in the meantime, I'll get rich, and my family will get rich, and nobody's going to do any better than me. Más del 50%, más del 50% del presupuesto se orientaba al pago de la deuda externa. Durante todo ese periodo fue una espada de Damocles. Fue un, el, el, la, la, el chantaje continuo con el que los organismos impusieron las políticas, eh, organismos internacionales, me refiero al Fondo Monetario, el Banco Mundial, impusieron políticas muy antipopulares. La dolarización fue un gran atraco, fue un, 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 un gran robo nacional. Primeramente, quiero decirles que agradezco la oportunidad de estar aquí hablando con ustedes, con todos ustedes. Vengo con el mayor de los respetos por la liderazgo en el que el Ecuador está teniendo en el proceso democrático. 
democrático. Compañeros, les pido, les pido silencio. Desde la Segunda Guerra Mundial, los sicarios económicos han creado un imperio global. I have asked uh, Robert McNamara to assume the responsibilities of Secretary of Defense, and I'm glad and happy to say that he has accepted this responsibility. Mr. McNamara leaves the presidency of the Ford Company at great personal sacrifice. What do you believe that will cost you? More than I like to say. <laughs> uh, 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 there will be profits foregone of approximately three million dollars during the next three to four years. Robert McNamara was a very, very significant player in all of this. And of course, in a way, he represents the corporatocracy because the, cor because the corporatocracy is composed of three pillars. The heads of big corporations, the heads of big banks, and the heads of government. McNamara represents it from the fact that he was president of Ford Motor Company, private sector, big corporation, and then he became the Secretary of Defense under Kennedy and Johnson. This is Play Coup, 250 miles north of Saigon, the air base that was ripped by Vietnamese communist guerrillas. 108 men were wounded in the guerrilla attack, 79 of them seriously. U.S. representatives in Saigon met with representatives of the South Vietnamese government. They jointly agreed that joint retaliatory action was required. The Viet Cong, the communists, have lost 89,000 men killed in South Vietnam. Thousands of demonstrators opposed to the Vietnam War assembled in the nation's capital for a mass protest. For the most part orderly, minor scuffles did occur between the demonstrators and hecklers. Robert McNamara, when he was Secretary of Defense, was there during a great deal of the Vietnam War. And he saw the, the futility of trying to uh, expand empire through the military. For many long and quite demanding years, Bob McNamara has guided the defense establishment. He has helped to give America the most efficient military strength in its history. In this intensely loyal, brilliant, and good man, America is giving to the world, and if I may be personal, uh, I am giving the world the very best that we have to win the most important war of all. He really made the World Bank into what it is today. When he entered the World Bank, it was lending about 900 million a year. When he left in 1981, it was lending 12 and a half billion a year. And then he was the one 
who really uh, uh, made poverty alleviation the bank's mission. It was McNamara who really came out with these very typically American sort of missionary statements about uh, we have to be our brother's keeper, you know, and help the poor and all this. And, and he really inspired people at the bank. They thought, well, this is just a, you know, we have a real mission, you know. You know, it's so like Wolfowitz bringing democracy to the, to the world. And, uh, <laughs> You are about to know the thrill of seeing that which has never been seen before. You are about to enter a beautiful, exciting, wonderful new world. For the first time in history, you'll see... Not one. Not two. come to Iran with respect for its citizens, for their great civilization, and for the religious faiths they practice. We will deliver food and medicine you need. Do not destroy oil wells, a source of wealth that belongs to the Iraqi people, the government of Iraq, and the future of your country will soon belong to you. We provided Saddam Hussein with a great deal of money and, and weapons. In fact, we brought Saddam Hussein into power. We lent him billions of dollars. We built chemical plants for him, knowing full well that these chemical plants were being used to produce chemical weapons that would be employed against the Kurds and the Iranians. But we continued to support this man. and. The economic hitman went in and tried to convince him to accept a deal similar to what the Saudis had accepted. One of the signs that the relationship wasn't working was when Bechtel uh, tried to get a pipeline built working with Saddam Hussein um, that would bring Iraqi oil out of the port of Aqaba, Jordan, and Bechtel would build this oil pipeline. And Saddam Hussein said no, and the fact that he said no to this huge deal was it was one of the signs that this guy isn't going to play ball as we want him to now had he accepted that deal he'd still be president but he didn't i'm not sure why uh, maybe just stubborn maybe crazy i don't know why he didn't accept but he didn't and so we sent in the jackals We had a series of CIA teams. I was head of one of them to go in and, and actually see if we could do a coup d'etat. I mean, we, we, when we went in, we walked across the border. Uh, we got in touch with military officers in January 1995 who said, yes, we can do a coup d'etat. The plan went forward, and the plan included taking a tank company surrounding Saddam's residence in Auja, it's a small city, forcing him to resign, arresting him or killing him. But it didn't work. Assassinating Saddam was a big risk. He had too many doubles, too many look-alikes. His own bodyguards didn't know whether they were guarding him or somebody else. <laughs> And so we sent the military in, the, the, the last resort. You got the economic hitmen when they fail, the jackals go in. If they fail too, then as a last resort, we send in the military. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, the great men and women who wear the uniform of the United States have already accomplished amazing things in Iraq, but their work is not done. We owe it to these noble Americans, to their Iraqi and coalition partners, and indeed to ourselves and to the world to finish the work 
that they have so nobly advanced? Ah, uh, Wolfowitz. Um, Paul Wolfowitz is the one man who has spent the largest percentage of his adult life trying to figure out how to unseat Saddam Hussein. <laughs> did take him out. Los recursos del Ecuador se usan en beneficio de los ecuatorianos, no para el explotación de corporaciones multinacionales que benefician solamente a otras personas en otros países. ¿Está dispuesto a declarar en una corte internacional de que esos pronósticos eran falsos para que nosotros podamos decir que esa deuda es mala? Ellos saben que nos han estado robando, que hemos pagado cuántas veces la deuda externa y muchos insisten todavía en negociarla, en pagarla. Cuando uno está en sabe perfectamente que no debemos pagar, uno dice, no podemos pagar una deuda que ya está diez veces pagada. Sin embargo, el país tiene una deuda grande, muy grande, tan grande que no puede pagarlo. Esto es un par una parte del plan. Esto es lo que pasó en Irak. It is a, it is a fallacy to say that there was no post-invasion plan for Iraq. There was a very clear plan. It was an economic plan to restructure the economy so that um, it would be switched from an economy that was essentially closed to foreign corporate access to one that was sort of a, a dream work of foreign corporate access. transport cargo planes to fly 144 pallet loads of $100 bills. Tons of American cash were flown over there. As the name implies, the Development Fund of Iraq was meant to be money used for the de development of Iraq. We, the coalition provisional authority, that was the sovereign government for Iraq, held those Iraqi funds in trust for the Iraqi people. And we dispersed against it for projects that were designed to build the country, that is, help the Iraqi people. That was the intention, that was the ideal. In reality, it, that system broke down in many ways. It's a total looting situation. 
in Iraq. We're stealing everything, basically. It's not just about oil, it's about everything. Yes, there's money being stolen, there's tremendous amounts of corruption. And there's a picture of $2 million sitting on a table uh, behind three of the government officials uh, at, uh, in, in Baghdad who were just handing out the cash to people. That's all they were doing, just handing out the cash all day long. <laughs> brand new hundred dollar bills all in shrink wrap they come in bricks of uh, one hundred thousand dollars and they took a thousand one hundred dollar bills and they wrapped it in cellophane uh, and they tossed it back and forth to each other like a football they would pass it back and forth to each other well i i played with it uh, we the shrink wrap it's about like that in size, so it's sort of a small football. And so we had fun with the bricks in our office, passing <laughs> the $100,000 brick, catching it, scoring a touchdown. So we played a small game of football with the cash while we were waiting for, uh, for uh, it to be picked up. Thank you, Mr. Governor. It's my third time back in Mosul, and I must say I've enjoyed it every time I've been here. Starting July 1st, Iraq will have its own government again. What? Starting July 1st, Iraq will have its own government again. But you won't be alone. We will still be supporting you. We have spilled blood with you and for you. And your success will be our success. June of 2004, there was a frantic rush to spend money. So you re literally had people pleading, sending emails to each other saying, uh, is there anybody who needs some money? I've got some money to give away. What kind of projects do you have that I can, I can send some money to? There were some military helicopters, three military helicopters were contracted and sent up to uh, Erbil to drop off the money. They then come back to Baghdad, and on the way back to Baghdad, they realized that they hadn't gotten a receipt for the money. <laughs> they had no way to account for how much money had been dropped off. We'd forgotten to get a bill for $1.4 billion. Go, go, go. There was $18 billion in money spent from the Development Fund of Iraq under the control of the Coalition Provisional Authority in the first 18 months of the occupation. Half of that, $9 billion, is unaccounted for. Nobody knows where it is. Nobody knows what happened to it. Nobody can tell you exactly how much money went into uh, the reconstruction. Uh, the reconstruction 
using Iraqi money. That's a black hole. Um, we don't know who it went to or what it went to. We know that about $9 billion was lost um, during the initial months of the occupation. <laughs> They've essentially done what the U.S. tries to do through the World Bank, which is to restructure economies in a way that favors the interests of multinational corporations. That's, that's the game. Here, they've taken off the velvet glove and used the iron fist in a way that is much more blatant uh, and obvious to anybody who cares to pay attention. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm sorry. Come on, you're almost there, really? <laughs> I fucked up. <laughs> Here. Can you see him? I can see him, sorry. I appreciate the, the world leaders taking my phone calls as I explain to them why I think Paul will be a, a strong president of the World Bank. Um, I've said he was a man of good experiences. He helped manage a large organization. The world Bank's a large organization. The Pentagon's a large organization. He's been involved in the management of that organization. He's a skilled diplomat. And Paul is committed to uh, development. He's a compassionate, decent man who will do a fine job in the World Bank. I uh, believe deeply and passionately in the mission of the World Bank. The opportunity of working to lift a billion people who earn less than a dollar a day out of poverty and billions of others who live in circumstances of poverty uh, to give them a fair chance in life is an exciting po responsibility and a real challenge. basically economic hitmen, you know. They spent $20 billion out of Iraq's money in this unbelievably wasteful and unaccountable fashion. And now Iraq has trouble financially and, in fact, you know, is in debt. And that's very convenient for the uh, U.S. government because in order for Iraq to get credit and investment or IMF support, there are certain conditionalities, and one of those conditionalities is privatize your oil. The International Monetary Fund signed an agreement with, with the Iraqi government in December 2005 for the cancellation of part of um, Iraq's external debt. And one of the conditions set by the International Monetary Fund was that 
the Iraqi government pass a law by the end of 2006. That law shifts the Iraqi oil industry from being in the public sector, which has been the case for nearly 35 years in Iraq, to being pr predominantly controlled by multinational companies. So the way that it went is, uh, okay, we will give you a structural adjustment program, okay? You liberalize, you deregulate, you privatize your economy, okay, uh, 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 as the quid pro quo, and the money that we give you will then be channeled into debt repayments to our commercial banks. Yes. It sounds like the same old scenario. And empires have always been built that way. It's just that this one has been done a little bit more secretly up until now. What's interesting, I think, about Iraq, in a way, is that things are really coming out in the open. Do you, Pentagon, promise to make war without end on countries that defy the civilized world by refusing to integrate with the global market economy? I do. Do you, World Bank, promise to continue forever and ever with policies such as water privatization, free trade, and labor deregulation? I do, most definitely. With the power vested in me by the President of the United States and by the U.S. Treasury and Defense Department, I now pronounce Pentagon and World Bank husband and wife. May the invisible hand of the free market bless their union. You may invade, dictate, and impoverish now. One thing that has impressed me a lot as I've traveled around the world is not only that the poorest countries of the world need and value the relationship with us, but even the very successful developing countries still find a benefit from working with the World Bank. Uh, you can go to places like Bolivia or Nigeria or Indonesia. You can go all over the world to very poor countries and you can talk to people who may be illiterate, can't even read the newspapers, but they know their country has just accepted a huge loan from the World Bank and they can look and see that big American corporations are in there building huge projects, power plants, and they know the electricity is not going to come to their little cardboard shacks on the canals of Jakarta, Indonesia, or to their little campesino farms uh, in, 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 in the countryside of Colombia or Bolivia or Ecuador. They know they're not going to benefit. <laughs> Certain things are really very simple and very clear. It's very clear and simple that the purpose of this is poverty reduction. It's very clear and simple the purpose of this is to increase our ability to provide usable resources, not to cut back on lending. And in fact, I'd note in the past year our lending has reached record levels, but it needs to go up further and we're going to need more money from donors. <laughs> hunger and wants should end, and as all ask him, no, he's a man of his word, on that he can't depend, so be prepared for prosperity, it's coming to your door, cause there will be no poverty once we kill off all the poor, last week he was bombing cities, now he's a financier, pay your debts or say goodbye, all hope for witnesses is here, he'll lead us to freedom, and we will be so glad. Just like those shoppers in that market in downtown Baghdad. Last week he was bombing cities, now he's a financier. Pay your debts or say goodbye, all hope for witnesses here. You know, a hundred years ago, there would be debt repayment crises in places like Venezuela and so on. And the U.S. and Germany and France were sending gunboats to collect the debt. So this is, in a way, it's a very old story. Now it's the IMF and the World Bank. We, we don't need the gunboats or the troops. You, you, you send in the, uh, 
the IMF and the World Bank to collect the debt. Mr. Volvoid, welcome to Guatemala. Very nice to meet you. It's an honor to meet you. It's my honor. I mean, there's no mafia on earth that has leverage like that. Yeah? Saudi Arabia as our biggest success as economic hitmen, um, and probably the one that in the long run has had the most impact on world history for a long time. The king sees the oil development as the greatest single means to modernize his country and improve the living standards of his people. The Navy has said that Saudi Arabian oil is one of its most important strategic sources of supply. Back in the 70s, we were facing this oil crisis. Uh, OPEC had decided to basically hold us hostage to them. And the Treasury Department came to me and other economic hitmen and said, you know, you." We've, we can't allow this to happen anymore. We can't be blackmailed by OPEC. You guys have to figure out a way to stop this. And we knew that the, this, the key to any su such solution lay with Saudi Arabia because we knew that the House of Saud was corruptible and Saudi Arabia had more oil than anybody else in the world. And so we worked out this deal with Saudi Arabia whereby the House of Saud would guarantee that the price of oil would stay within limits reasonable to us and we'd guarantee that the House of Saud would stay in power. So what we agreed to do was not investigate Saudi Arabia, not condemn it, not look into it if it would pump oil. It was a gentleman's agreement. You will not find a piece of paper. But it was always understood. Now, in the case of Saudi Arabia, in the long run, there was what we call blowback. It's a CIA term. It means that a policy that you think has worked to your advantage ultimately blows back in your face. If 15 of the suicide bombers on 9-11 were Saudis, right? How many Saudis have been indicted, have gone to jail for 9-11? None. There's so much resentment, there's so much blowback in the world around this empire that the United States and its allies have, have managed to build in the last uh, three or four decades. Monotony and poverty were the common lot. But in their abiding faith, they found solace. For religion is not worn like a cloak in the Arab land. It is a vital part of every good Muslim's life. Muhammad united the Arabs, purified their customs, bound them into one people, and filled them with a great faith. Five times a day, even the humblest Arab stops his work, faces Mecca, and intones the sacred words of the Quran. La ilaha illallah, wa Muhammad Rasul Allah. There is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet. for me really to write the book was 9-11. After 9-11, shortly afterwards, I, I flew up to Ground Zero in New York where the World Trade Centers had been. 
And as I stood there, the, the, this pit was still smoldering, and you could still smell burning human flesh. And I was greatly moved by this experience. And as I stood there looking into that terrible pit, I realized that I had to take responsibility for what was going on. That while Osama bin Laden may be a mass murderer who should be brought to justice, the fact of the matter is a great deal of the world looks at him as a hero. So it was very clear to me on that day that I stood there looking down into that terrible pit where the World Trade Centers had once stood, that I needed to tell this story, that I needed to come clean on what we've done in, in the past 50 years since World War II. And I realized that the American people did not understand why someone had done what uh, Osama bin Laden had done and that we need to understand that. It needs to be very clear to us. It was very frightening to me. I knew that I was going up against strong forces. I mean, I was an economic hitman. I saw jackals at work. So I was very, very concerned about these things. And I, I was concerned about uh, my physical well-being, too, and that of my family. I don't know how much longer I've got to live. Could be. 20 more days, or it could be 20 more years, but it can't be a lot longer than that. In 20 years, I'll be 80, and I may live a little longer, but it, you know, as a writer, as a productive member of society, and from that standpoint, um, I don't have a lot of time left. Uh, so I decided I want to devote the rest of my life, however long that may be, to making this a better world for my daughter and her brothers and sisters all over the world. And that's what I must do. And so it doesn't really matter what the repercussions are. I must write this book because that's taking the first step. I was working in Panama with Omar Torrijos as an economic hitman. At the same time with your father, he was very nationalistic and, 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 and a real populist. And he basically said no to the United States. He said, we're not going to do things your way anymore, which was rather shocking, I think, to, the, to Washington. And Part of my motivation was I wanted to succeed with Omar Torrijos, and I wanted to succeed with your father, because for me it would, would save lives. The thing is that when they, they died, for us it was like the end of the world for me. I was 17. And uh, what happened afterwards, and I, I remember this it, like a blur, because Years after, I have to be, I have to, to read about that, that period of time to remember, because I almost forget all that year. I almost forgot all that year. He said that Ecuadorian resources ought to be used to help the Ecuadorian people, not to make foreign corporations rich. sent the jackals in to assassinate him.
Entonces se dice claramente que en el caso de Torrijos, una pequeña grabadora dentro del avión en el que él viajaba uh -huh. tenía la, la bomba que estalla uh -huh. y que hace que ese avión caiga y muera Omar Torrijos. Sí, esa es mi opinión, sí. Y también yo creo que casi es algo parecido pasó, pasó con General Dost. Es John Perkins, lo reitero, eh, confesiones de un sicario económico. Esta noche en el Teatro Prometeo, a las 7 de la noche, ahí en la Casa de la Cultura, ¿conoces ya el Prometeo, eh, John? Ya no, no, nunca he estado. Es absolutamente circular, es como los teatros griegos, tú vas a estar rodeado de público. Ah. Eh, entonces el público desde todos los ángulos te va a poder ver, ah, muy bien. que también es simbólico. No vas a poder ocultar nada, Ajá. te vas a someter a otro detector de mentiras. Muy bien. Llamar a la reflexión de que de pronto los países pequeños también somos dignos, de que hay una gran reserva moral en países pequeños como el Ecuador, de que hay una gran reserva moral en cada uno de nosotros y en presidentes como Roldós. A mí aún me es difícil hablar de la muerte de mis padres y en este momento sí, y aquí en este lugar sí, son como la hija de Jaime y Marta. Oyendo a, a estas palabras de, de Marta Rodós, me puso muy, muy emo mucha emoción en mi corazón. Tengo que pensar un momento. Aquí en Quito cayó el imperio incaico. Aquí en Quito empezó la caída del imperio español. Y aquí en Quito, el Ecuador, caerá también el imperio norteamericano. Dice... Pero es que es elemental, ¿cómo entendemos? No se necesita tanta filosofía, tantas ideologías para entender de que todos los recursos que están en el territorio ecuatoriano tienen que ser para los 13 millones de ecuatorianos. Yo no entiendo otra cosa. Yo no entiendo. Y que no tiene, dice el señor Parkin, que no tiene que ser para las nacionales, que ellos viven allá corrompiéndose. Por lo tanto, en esta asamblea que viene con patriotas, a diferencia de la del 98 en la que se privatizó todo, todos los recursos naturales, la minería, el petróleo, el pueblo, le dejaremos solo y le tocará rendir cuentas a la historia. decirles además que he venido acá a ofrecer una disculpa para las acciones que mi país y sus cooperaciones han tomado. Debo aceptar mi responsabilidad personal por algunos de estos actos. Por todo esto quiero disculpa, disculpa el tarmen. 